So good evening again, and uh, welcome to the Australian National University, the last panel in the vote 2016 federal election series. My name is uh, Paul Bongiorno. I'm uh, more a uh, a, writing, a writer than a broadcast journalist these days, uh, writing for things like the Saturday paper, the New Daily Online, and um, even the Canberra Weekly. So uh, you probably can pick that up at any supermarket. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> um, I still dip the toe in the water broadcasting, talking to Fran Kelly and various other people, and Channel 10 have kindly let me uh, be a mentor, so there you go. So that's who I still am. Um, so every Tuesday night since the election was called, ANU public policy experts have been getting together to discuss the key issues of the 2016 federal election. So I'd like to uh, introduce tonight's eminent, uh, I'd like to introduce tonight's eminent panel, adjunct Professor Bob McMullen, on the extreme my extreme left, your extreme right. John's on my extreme right, but I know he's I, I know he's not. In fact, anyway. I'm in the extreme middle. Anyway, there you go. Uh, back to adjunct Professor Bob McMullen. He's recently joined the Crawford School of Public Policy after a long and distinguished career in the Australian Parliament, including as Senator for the ACT and Member for Canberra. And I'd like to remind you, he was actually the uh, National Campaign Director for three successful federal campaigns, the 1983 Drover's Dog election that, John, uh, that uh, Bob Hawke won, and then the subsequent two elections. So he's... Um, brings with him considerable expertise on campaigning. He's also a member of the High Level Advisory Group on Climate Change Financing, which was mobilised during the UN Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen in December 2009. Then I have Dr Jill Shepherd. She's a political scientist and survey researcher in the Australian Centre for Applied Social Research Methods here at ANU. Jill's a primary author of uh, the ANU Poll, a survey of Australia's attitudes towards major issues. Her current research projects explore the role of ethnicity and pre-immigration background on Australian political activists and voting behaviour in federal elections. Then I have Dr Andrew Hughes. He's a lecturer in marketing at the ANU College of Business and Economics. Prior to his academic career, Andrew worked in marketing, management and strategy for some of Australia's biggest organisations in the financial industri industrial and service marketing sectors. Um, and then I have, and what happened to my good friend, Dr John Hewson? <laughs> John, I know you're here, and I even... <laughs> Um, anyway, over there on my right, but on everybody else's left, um, is Dr. John Hewson. Uh, he's now a professor here at the ANU, uh, and he was um, a staffer for many years for the Federal Liberal Party and, um, and its leaders, and he himself became federal leader, and he has a personal and bruising experience of a federal election campaign, having led the Liberals uh, and the coalition in the 1993 election. Would you please welcome all of the panellists? Uh, well, look, since I've been in, um, in, the, in the print media, I've been uh, taught that you have to grab interest with the headline and the first paragraph. So I thought that the first, first paragraph tonight, I should just cut to the chase, um, start uh, up this end of the panel and just get a brief overview from our panellists on how they think Saturday will play out. I guess that's a nice way of saying who's going to win Dr John Hewson. <laughs> Look, uh, there are two, two possible scenarios. One is, <laughs> one is um, you know, Malcolm does pretty well, he doesn't lose too many seats. And people will be basically giving him, I think, the benefit of the doubt, if that's the case, on the basis that, you know, he came in with great expectations, sure, he's disappointed people, but you know, he hasn't had a fair run, let's give him a run, that sort of attitude. The other, the other alternative is the possibility that the independents and minor parties do actually pretty well, even in the lower house. I tend to, defer, to think the first rather than the second, although the Xenophon factor is very difficult to judge in South Australia and more broadly. I think in the upper house, well, you know, we've got new Senate voting rules and we've got a double dissolution. 
and nobody has a clue how that's going to wash out. I suspect we won't get too many more Greens. I think we'll probably get the same sort of rump, six or eight independents, but of different persuasions. Probably Pauline Hanson, probably um, <laughs> Jackie Lambie, probably uh, Darren, uh, Darren Hinch, uh, you know, um, a mixed bag, and I think we'll just go into the same sort of instability we've had for the last several years. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think Malcolm Turnbull inch across the line. Um, it's been an interesting campaign from him. Uh, he's tried to run a, a very low emotion, low response campaign all the way through, and I think it's worked so far. He hasn't got too far sucked into any of the Labor um, scare campaign tactics to get him into a one-on-one -on -one fight. Um, so for that reason, I think it'll inch across the line, but I think, that, as John said, the bigger picture to watch on Saturday night is going to be the Senate. Um, Glenn Lazarus in Queensland's done very, very well, particularly in the west of the state. He's got a lot of traction out there. Um, and of course, Jackie Lambie and Pauline Hanson, again, are people to watch. And the X Factor in South Australia, I really have loved that part of the campaign. Um, as a marketer, I, hats off to him for what he's done, because he's done everything right as a marketer. So, uh, even though he's a politician, so there's a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a something going on there. But um, yeah, for, for mine, I think it'd be more interesting to watch the Senate on Saturday night and see how that plays out. Okay, well, um, I, I, I noticed today in the Fairfax papers that um, John Sturton, who's been a pollster for a long time, looked at 11 polls um, published um, in June, and he came up with uh, the Liberals 50.5 to Labor um, 49.5, which uh, statistically is line bore. We had the essential today 51.49 Labor. We had Galaxy on the weekend 50.50. So statistically, it looks like it's a deadlocked uh, election. Interestingly enough, a majority of people polled in all the polls still think the Liberals will win, that, uh, that uh, Malcolm Timber will get along the line. But as the election has gone over, the number of people thinking that has shrunk. The other interesting thing is Malcolm Turnbull has shrunk as well, and uh, Bill Shorten has has uh, slowly built uh, built some uh, momentum. Whether it's enough to get him across the line is doubtful. I would think that with uh, this deadlock, you'd have to uh, think the incumbents will make it, especially as there is a lot of residual goodwill to Malcolm Turnbull, even though it is dissipating. Look, I, I don't disagree at all, Paul. And, and I wish I had something much more, you know, enlightening and interesting and provocative to say, but I think John kind of hit the nail on the head that um, Turnbull will probably kind of creep over the line. But I think predicting this election is an absolute mugs game. I want nothing to do with it. And um, <laughs> I think the Senate, I mean, the whole idea, this is sort of the post hoc justification for the double dissolution was to clear out the Senate yeah. rabble. Mm. You don't do that with a double dissolution by lowering the quota. You, it's going to end up a, an absolute dog's breakfast. Um, and then in terms of, of how the, the polls have shaken out, it's sort of, you know, 50 all or 49.5, 50.5. Um, I, I think there's no indication that that's distributed evenly across the country. Um, God knows what's going on in South Australia with Xenophon. I'm, I'm a bit iffy on some of those polls that, that put him at sort of 24 or 25% of the primary vote in the House of Reps. Uh, I don't know people are that... I don't know that so many people are that happy to change their vote to what is basically an unknown prospect. I know everyone knows Xenophon and he's the master marketer and Andrew and I will fight to the death about Nick Xenophon. It's not marketing, it's politics, and it's people. But... Um, Jill, behave yourself, we're in public. But it's... it's oh, he treats people with such disrespect. But... <laughs> but, uh, look, God knows, Bob. <laughs> well... That's slightly higher authority than I'm usually allowed to <laughs> quote, but uh, the, the remarkable thing is that nobody does know. I mean, when the election was called, certainly when Malcolm took over as Prime Minister, everyone thought it was going to be a canter for him, and it looked like it for a while, but in my view, since he wimped out on the tax issue in February, his polling has collapsed and his, preferred prime, his relative preferred Prime Minister position compared to Bill has fallen by 28 points in four months. That is almost unprecedented. Uh, you'd have to be doing something pretty outrageous to lose that much. But it's really disappointment. John got that right. I think it's no, people don't hate Malcolm or anything like that. They're just really disappointed because they thought he was going to be stronger and decisive, and he hasn't been. Uh, and I think that's been... A mistake, but I'm not sure that it's going to cost him the election. I think 
there are three possibilities because it is possible that Labor will get over the line. I think it depends what's happening in Western Australia. Clearly there's a big swing on in Western Australia, but there needs to be a very big swing for it to start uh, picking up any seats. But once it starts, you've got to remember I grew up in Perth, I'm scarred by the experience. Um, uh, a whole lot will go all at once. There's, there's about nothing till 5%, and then between 5 or 7, 8, 9%, there's about 5 or 6 seats. So it could be a big swing that achieves nothing, but it doesn't have to be much bigger, and there suddenly start to be a lot of seats. So I wouldn't make any predictions too early in the night because we'll be two hours into it before the West Australian count starts. Uh, which is better than it used to be. I remember watching on TV in 1975, and by the time the telecast came, we'd already lost uh, in Western <laughs> Australia. Um, so that was really a lot of fun. But uh, <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, I don't have any serious idea who's going to win. You'd have to say Malcolm would be the favourite because of incumbency uh, and because people are not really angry with him. But the Victorian experience shows that sometimes go even governments people don't hate can be defeated after one term if they are disappointing and if there's some independent activity going on. And I agree that uh, Xenophon is the interesting character. Uh, let me say about the Senate, nobody will be looking at the Senate on Saturday night. Uh, and it might have been the ostensible reason for calling the election, but it actually had nothing to do with it at all. Uh, I remember being involved in calling a double dissolution election and we didn't even think about the Senate. Mm. We thought, can we win the House of Representatives election or not? We thought we could, so we called it. Mm. And we never even gave the Senate a thought. And uh, I think that's what's happened this time too. Now, I did forget, because I got a bit confused before, to do a commercial that I've been asked to do. <laughs> so this series has been presented in partnership with uh, policyforum.net, which is based here at the Crawford School of Public Policy. Policyforum.net is the Crawford School's platform for analysis and discussion uh, about um, the region's public policy challenges. The podcast of tonight's panel and every panel in the series will be available at uh, visitanu.edu.au slash news and click on the 2016 Federal Election Series banner to find out more. I've got one more commercial, but I'll wait till a bit later. <laughs> um, look, uh, just interestingly, on the, on the Senate, I was um, talking to one of uh, my contacts up in Queensland, a Liberal MP, and she told me that um, she's been on the booth for the pre-polling and the amount of confusion is enormous with the Senate. Uh, people are extremely confused and even though there's a safety valve uh, built in by, uh, by the Senate so that if, if it's clear, if you've only made one mistake on your ballot paper and it's clear who you wanted to vote for, it'll be counted as a valid vote. But uh, the fear is that uh, there'll be more than uh, one mistake and that, that is a worry. The other interesting thing I noticed that um, Anthony Green analysing a couple of weeks ago uh, some of the stuff that came out on the Senate thought we could see a crossbench of nine with six Greens even, so uh, and, and and two to three fewer LNP or Liberal Nationals in the Senate. So if that happens, um, uh, the gamble of cleaning out the stable, um, the, the, the um, Malcolm might find he's got more poo in there than he counted for. <laughs> anyway, having uh, having said that. Um, Having, having said that, let's, uh, let's go on to Brexit in broad terms. I heard a very interesting conversation on Radio National with, uh, with you, John, so maybe if you could give us your thoughts to what extent Brexit will affect or can affect the election, and I guess in one sense, very importantly, it can affect Australia, whatever, whoever wins the election. Just say one thing about Brexit, it tells you you can't believe the polls and you can't believe the betting odds. Yeah. And I'd apply that generally to this campaign as well. I yeah. uh, I, I think there is a fundamental difference, and I'm and I was going to apologise, John, but Sorry. no, bugger it, I'm, I'm sticking on. to this. The, the difference we have in Australia is that we know the denominator of who votes. So we're not trying to calculate, we're not being lied to about who will vote and who won't. And that, that's a huge difference. Yeah, okay. But I don't necessarily hold much stock in the polls either. just go to the Victorian election, the Queensland election. <laughs> the ALP had nine seats in Queensland yeah. out of 89 and won. You know, like it, you can't judge, I don't think we can rely on them as we used to. Having said that, I think personally Brexit's a disaster. Uh, very, very badly run campaign, I think. Um, 
and a lot of exaggeration on both sides. And I noticed that uh, the, um, the, uh, the exit team made sort of three commitments. One was to save the 350 million pounds a week that was paid to mm. Brussels, uh, which is nonsense. Uh, two, that uh, you'd reform the immigration policy. And three, you'd stop about five million um, uh, refugees that would come if Turkey and four African nations were added to the, to the uh, EU. And now they're saying that they weren't actually promises, they were, they, they were uh, opportunities. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's indicative, I think, of, of what's happened. In terms of impact, I mean, obviously the financial sector is going to be pretty badly damaged for quite some time. I think the UK will go into recession, if not Europe. Europe's been struggling to avoid a triple dip recession with deflation, so, you know, this is not going to help them. But a lot of uncertainty in the negotiating process I mean, two to seven years to exit, I suspect, renegotiate trade deals uh, and, and governance arrangements and so on. From our point of view, it's just another layer of uncertainty in the global economy, which is you know, seeing growth rates downgraded pretty consistently. And, uh, you know, in these circumstances, very low growth is not out of the question in the developed world. A large part of the emerging world is already in recession. Um, and. Um, World trade fell 14% last year. You want a king hit it again? That's what you're doing, because Europe is still the second largest economy in the world. And so, you know, there are a lot of factors there that I think were, were ignored or downplayed in terms of what would happen. But um, what it says to me about what we've heard in this campaign is I don't believe any of the commitments on either side, really. I don't think most of them will be delivered, because I think the budgetary situation is much worse than they've been prepared to admit. They've happily worked with very optimistic forecasts for growth, wages, and so on. Uh, you get a more realistic assessment, uh, you change that dramatically. So the old game will be on. Whoever wins will stand up and say, well, things were a hell of a lot worse than we thought they were. So I'll have to have a tough budget. And I guess if it's an Abbott-style first budget, we'll have a hostile Senate. I ask, what have we gained in about four years? So, Bob, uh, the wisdom is that, uh, and, and um, please jump in, but the wisdom is that Brexit did um, the um, incumbent govern government, the coalition government, a huge favour here. It got uh, everybody talking economics and, as John just said, instability. And, of course, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, as Prime Minister, said now's not the change to tie, uh, change uh, horses. Has, uh, do you agree with the, with the wisdom and has... Labor got an answer to that that uh, that uh, in any way can um, uh, nu neutralise it. I think in in the first instance it will be a a plus for uh, the government. It's a question of whether it lasts. I mean, I realise we're only talking about a week, but. Uh, People will, in the first flush, say, "Golly, this is uncertain," and they're therefore more likely to support the incumbent. I think, but uh, as people unpack it, the underlying drivers of Brexit, I think, are playing out in in miniature in this election, uh, and I think uh, that that will, in the ultimately, be uh, at least an equalising factor for the Labor Party. But whether they can get that message through between now and Saturday, I've no idea. I don't think it'll be a very big factor, but the most likely thing is it will be a, uh, a plus for the coalition. Uh, I have to say on the polling, there was a very interesting article today by, on the YouGov website indicating that not that, that they themselves got it wrong, but some of the other pollsters got the, the result absolutely right. So uh, I don't think we should be too down on the polling, but uh, I think I agree with John's analysis of the consequences of Brexit. I think it was a disastrous campaign by the Tories, by the Labour Party, by everybody on that side of the debate, uh, and uh, they got a very sad result for Britain, for and for the world. You know uh, what occurs to me, Jill, I don't want you to think of this, that um, it's a lesson too about so-called no-brainer referendums. You know, uh, all the polling, for example, ahead of 1999, it was a no-brainer that we, you know, wanted to be a republic. Um, if you can believe Malcolm Turnbull, it's a no-brainer that if we have a plebiscite on, on marriage equality that, that it uh, will get up. Um, do you think that uh, the Brexit result says anything that may or may not influence the way people people will vote? I, I think we, we all have um, a tendency to overestimate the progressiveness of, of voters everywhere. Uh, voters are, are incredibly inherently uh, conservative, I think, and change is, is, 
I don't want to say scary because that runs down people who, you know, may, may not like change and, and paints them as sort of being timid or something else. But, I mean, we need to be convinced to change things. The status quo is not always so bad. And so I think sometimes there's... Um, but I we've mean, seen dramatic... I mean, what we saw in, in uh, Britain was dramatic change. With leave, yeah, I, um, it's such an easy sell, though, isn't it? Nationalism and, and this sort of almost nativist idea that you know we're going to hunker back down and, and be our own country again. Uh, I think everyone has underestimated again the conservatism of, of British voters who or want to be, go back to being British. Or the potency of immigration. Yeah, and I think that's one of the other important things out of Brexit too is looking at how the campaigns were run and and how people have looked at some of the other. Um, attributes of campaigning like nowadays and in 2016, like social media, I, you know, um, people overestimate the power of social media and they over rely upon it as an indi indi indicator of behaviour, right? So mm. I think one of the things people assume, particularly the younger voters, is because they're active on social media talking about the campaign, that everyone assumed, okay, well, these guys got to vote to remain. But it didn't happen because they didn't actually vote. They just talked about voting and talked about yeah, the issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, I, and I think that's the other thing too. Here in Australia we have compulsory voting, but it doesn't equal compulsory engagement. Yes. And so people aren't tuned into the message, messages necessarily all the way through. And I think that's one thing out of Brexit we should take a lesson from is don't put an over-reliance upon one method to indicate behaviour on election day. So um, in terms of, you know, maybe how the message might play out um, in my head, I was thinking as soon as the vote happened, I thought, well, here's a free kick for the coalition straight away because um, they haven't run a scare campaign. They've gone hardly negative at all. Their advertising spell on negatives only bumped up in the last four days. And here's a perfect one they can run. They can go, well, if you change right now, and Labor have talked about increasing deficits in the first four years, what will happen? Remember, what, this is what happened over here. They didn't expect that to happen. These consequences now hitting the economy, hitting the news headlines. It's all of a sudden there's dissonance in people. Mm. Um, you know, as John said, um, I think just to us before he walked in the room, um, post-purchase buyer behaviour has been quite noticeable. You know, the way Google was going um, nuts with people googling what the EU was after well, the vote it wasn't, happened. It wasn't going nuts. That was a bit of a beat up as well. So, we're, oh, we're, Jill, calm down. But we're, <laughs> but we're liable to falling in that trap too of saying, well, you know, we've read a lot of Guardian columns that say people are really regretting this. But again, it's not engagement. It's not engagement. You've got to. It's, you have to move away from that just because you're talking about something I'm just because you're on you. social media yeah i know but <laughs> i want to okay <laughs> so um just uh, time for another commercial break uh, I, uh, 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 I invite you to join the twitter conversation using the hashtag capital a u s capital p o l ospol and um small our a o o u r capital a and u um Could before I one other point yeah, sure, go, before go ahead john that there's a global trend that's really worrying that's evidenced in the Brexit vote and more generally, and that's anti-globalisation, uh, anti-free of trade, mm. anti-immigration, yes. mm. and that's uh, you're seeing the birth of a lot of uh, minor parties on the right and the left in Europe, for example. Mm. You've got Trump in the US, uh, you've got Xenophon to some extent tapping that mood in South Australia. Um, you know, th that's a worrying global trend yep. to sort of undo uh, what we've we've gained in the last 40 or 50 years mm, by absolutely. taking a more open okay. attitude. Look, before I throw it over to the floor, I do want to uh, just briefly discuss with the panel um, marriage equality. You might notice, um, and um, uh, this comes out uh, in various uh, discussions on Twitter from people from the left, the right, the trolls and all sorts, if people use the term marriage equality, they're in favour of, of it. If they use same-sex marriage, they're generally not, even though, of course, they're the a description of the same thing. So I'm calling it marriage equality, and you can <laughs> make of that what, what you like. But Andrew, what uh, you who study what motivates people and, and ads and all the rest of it, uh, I notice um, Shorten uh, and the Greens, as the campaign have gone on, has gone on, have made a bigger deal of marriage equality. Um, and, and we saw Malcolm Turnbull has uh, assured people that 
that the plebiscite will get up, he um, and his wife will vote for it, and, uh, and, and when the whole country votes for it, the parliament will absolutely vote for it. Then we got a warning last night from Peter Credlin, who intimately knows the workings of the current um, parliamentary uh, party room uh, of the Libs and the Nats. Um, she was warning that, uh, that this has the potential to blow up the coalition uh, after the election. Now, what, how that plays out, I don't know. What's your opinion of, of uh, marriage equality? Is it a vote changer? Is it, uh, is it proxy for something else? Um, what do you think? Look, I think it's a, it's a vote changer in the inner city seats in Melbourne and Sydney and even Brisbane, um, you know, because I think that issue matters to people in those areas. Mm. And that's the whole point where you, you can see a change. And I think this could, gets back to what Jill talked about before about some of these seat-by-seat -seat polling figures are very rubbery at the moment and they will change definitely for sure. And that could be the, the side of someone. And all it has to be is 3 or 4% of people in a seat like that and the and the seat changes hands. Mm. Um, it's enough to sway the preferences. So the seat of Wentworth, your old seat, John, it won't change hands on this issue, will it? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a significant issue in that seat, but mm. I don't think it's a dominant issue. I think it's, mm. uh, it could change votes depending on which way it goes. I mean, there's effect, it has been a pretty effective campaign run in Wentworth. Well, I think an art dealer, actually. Um, he wants the old Malcolm back. That's his campaign team, you know, bring back the old Malcolm, I miss Malcolm. The guy that stood for, you know, marriage equality, the guy that stood for climate change and tax reform and so on. And that's probably had a bit of an impact in the, in the seat, beyond the humour of it. I think uh, that probably has captured a bit of a view, the dis disappointment nationally. But, um, you know, I don't think it's uh, one of the top five issues, for, let's say, or something like that. I think it's a, a lesser issue across the country, although in particular seats, Sydney and Melbourne, said, I think it can make a difference. What do you think, Jill? Uh, I'm more dubious. I just, it doesn't cut across uh, political allegiances in the way that something like immigration does or, um, well, I can only really think of immigration at the moment, even asylum seekers. Uh, there might be people out there, as uh, John and Andrew both say, some of these seats are going to end up pretty damn tight, I think, so maybe there's something to it. I might be running it down. But before I um, ask you, I was talking today to um, one of the uh, executives in, uh, in 10 News who's of Lebanese descent, and he says that Labor could be in trouble in Western Sydney, especially in the seats where there is a high uh, Muslim and uh, Lebanese uh, population on this issue because they don't like it. Well, of course, uh, you shouldn't assume that the votes are all going to go one way, but I don't think it's going to be a big or decisive issue in any seat, really, but perhaps one or two. But I think the idea of a plebiscite is disastrous for the country. Uh, it is... Uh, just a platform for homophobia and that Malcolm with all his background could say that it's not going that that is not going to happen is just off with the fairies I mean it is a serious serious concern for the future of the country I think I think the plebiscite will be carried I think the 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 bill will be carried in the parliament eventually, but it's going to be a bitter and divisive and unnecessary conflict that I think is really, really very sad. I suspect Turnbull is hoping you know, furiously that the plebiscite bill doesn't get up and that he can sort of palm this away from whence it came. It's, it will be a nightmare. Well, there's been a, um, that was the warning that Credlin gave on the Bolt Show last night on, uh, on Foxtel. Was, uh, well, I, I wasn't watching Credlin no, no. on the Bolt Show. <laughs> I, it, was I, reported, I it, it was reported in all the papers. Uh, well, uh, too, too young to read the newspaper. Yeah, yeah, well, what, but the point is that, that she and the Conservatives suspect that this is exactly what Malcolm's up to, that he'll put up a bill, that it'll be voted down, if not in the reps, depending on how the numbers go there, but certainly uh, in the Senate. Then he'll say, well, there you are, I've given, given it my best shot, we'll now put it to the Parliament. Anyway, that's to play out, and she says if that happens, there'll be uh, World War Three inside the coalition. Does anyone have a question? That gentleman just behind you. Yes, I just want to uh, take up the issue of, um, uh, of pretext, but also apply to the Australian situation and take issue with you, John Eden. I'm a great fan of the fantastic work that you do on climate change. Those economic reforms, lauded by the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, actually hurt a lot of people in the Australian community. That's why um, we had the phenomenon of Hanson and Phil, Phil Cleary. 
and we've had, uh, since that period of time, a growth in inequality uh, in Australia. And um, we've also had this interesting situation whereby our per capita growth has actually declined relative to Scandinavian countries, which went down an entirely different economic reform path, which was much more equitable and, and, and much fairer. And that's the underlying, a really powerful underlying d dynamic in people's voting, voting behaviour. In this election, what I'm picking up out in the regions, um, speaking to people there, is that people are really turned off this election. They're, they're not even talking about it a great deal. They obviously don't trust the Labor Party uh, or the Liberal Party. And I think we're going to have a weird and wonderful night on, on Saturday night. I think that um, Oakshot and Windsor have got some chance of getting up. Um, well, polling has indicated uh, that, uh, that that is the case. I'm not saying they will get up, but they'll still get quite a, a substantial vote. Unfortunately, Hanson will, and of course in South Australia, Xenophon, Xenophon will. A lot of people out there are wanting some alternative to the political, uh, political status quo. And we just can't go on believing that all those economic reforms were all absolutely wonderful and fair and, and, and good for the country, um, because they certainly, uh, there's a lot of Australians who don't agree with that. I, I agree that inequality is a very significant issue in this country and it's got a lot worse, to some extent compounded by the reforms, but to some extent not, the, the reforms were not done with an eye to worrying about the impact on inequality. It could have been addressed in a lot of those things and it hasn't been. And of course it's easy to tap that mood and that populist sentiment that a, that a Xenophon can tap, for example, in South Australia where you know, the state has got the highest unemployment rate. It's, uh, Manufacturing sectors seriously in decline. Uh, you know, a lot of dislocation with the car, the car industry going and, and so on. It's easy to tap that mood. But you know, one of the problems with the minor parties is that they know they'll never be in government. They'll never have to deliver any of this stuff. And the danger is that, of course, they're not even constructive in their, in their approach. And I think, personally, one of the problems with the Greens is they've progressively gone more and more and more extreme to make themselves marginally less relevant than they would otherwise have been. And, uh, you know, you'll get a protest vote, I think, and that's why I said there were two, or two possible outcomes, and just to judge the protest vote, the strength of it, it'll be there. Uh, but um, I suspect in current circumstances and a feeling of, of not anger against Malcolm, but disappointment, that I sort of say, OK, well, give, him a, give him his chance, we'll give him a term and see how it goes. You know, that's more likely the outcome, even though the sentiments are very strong. I think the problem with some of the extreme elements of that is it brings out the worst in our society. And to me, the Hanson brings out absolutely the worst. Absolutely. And uh, we've got to, you've got to find ways to deal better with that than we have done in the past. I absolutely agree with, uh, with that. I think I've been basically in support of the open Australia policies, both economically and, interna and in terms of international trade. But we do have to accept that we've we've left a lot of people behind, you know. I, I say there's, in Australia, we have all sorts of divisions, but there's one, which is there's 90,000 people read the Financial Review and there's everybody else. And, uh, uh, <laughs> well, they give a lot away. Um, uh, but uh, there is a danger that uh, the people like me and John and others who share this view, and I, I basically do, not totally, but basically support those open policies, we talk to each other all the time and not to anybody else. And that's certainly what happened in the north of the UK. Uh, there's a whole lot, a whole swathe of the country being totally left behind and they were totally ignored during the whole uh, Brexit campaign. And they took, and I hold, the, uh, I'm also a member of the British Labour Party, but I hold it responsible. That's why it failed, because the British Labor Party had no guts. They didn't go up and campaign in the North and say, this is why you need to stay in. And they took the soft option and they copped the, they copped the consequences. Another question or comment? Malcolm Harrington, the Canberra local. Thank you so much for these policy forums. It's fabulous to have the opportunity to ask the questions. Malcolm Turnbull. Can you put the mic just a bit closer to Malcolm your mouth? Thank Turnbull you. has been saying that a minority government will necessarily be chaotic and dysfunctional based on recent evidence. Is that always going to be the case, or is that just because Tony Abbott made it so? <laughs> we we are um, in Australia incredibly lucky and incredibly. Um, 
oh, I'm, I'm using some really harsh terms tonight. Uh, we don't appreciate how stable our political system is. So after 2010, we, we ask all these baseline measures about how do you feel about the direction of the country? Are you satisfied with Australian democracy? Do you trust the parties? One hung parliament and everything just fell through the floor. Um, it, there's no reason why a minority parliament should be chaotic or anything else. In the same reason, in the same way that there's no, no, I guess prima facie reason a, a balance of power led Senate or controlled Senate would be chaotic. But we we get it, conniptions about it. We uh, seem to trust the major parties far more than we should. Well, I think there's a distinction between a hung House of Representatives and a House of Representatives in conflict with the Senate. Uh, I'm a partisan, so obviously I want my side to win, but I don't have any hang-ups about a hung parliament. That is, there's no crisis about that in the House of Representatives. Someone will negotiate a majority, form a government, and they'll get most of their legislation through. It's not the same when you have different majorities in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Then you can get stagnation because you can't get anything through because the two sides are, uh, the two uh, houses are in conflict. But. Uh, I don't, uh, as a matter of principle, think the idea of uh, nobody having a majority is particularly important. It's, uh, I agree with uh, the analysis that it is a peculiar Australian fascination mm. that you have to have uh, one party in a majority all the time. It doesn't, as I say, I've, obviously I prefer it, I'm a partisan, but trying to be as objective as I can, I don't regard it as a big problem at all. Ironically, um, we, we've actually um, had um, minority um, parliaments in the lower house for uh, forever in a day, almost in Australia. With, uh, but we think of the coalition as the coalition party. But, but the Liberals and the Nats, um, you know, the country parties they used to be, they have to sit down and sometimes they have, you know, quite forthright and um, you know tough negotiations to form a, a, a government. And of course, one of the interesting things that may happen this election is if the Liberals lose more seats than the Nats, the relativities in the coalition could change dramatically and um, they could uh, uh, and that will empower the more conservative end of the of the coalition namely the nats uh, anyone else? We've had lots of experience in state parliaments too of minority governments that yeah. have functioned quite effectively. Okay. While that's happening, I think that the, the, uh, the gentleman was right. It was Tony Abbott very effectively defined the minority um, government as um, chaotic. And what added to the um, salience of that charge was the undermining of Gillard by an angry Rudd. I think Oakeshott and, and Windsor's kind of posturing didn't help either. They, uh, Gillard would have, must have been furious. Yeah. Although, I mean, uh, the point is that uh, at, at no, even though everyone thought that the minority government could fall any moment, and uh, Tony Abbott kept reminding us of that, Bob Catter, for one, said, "No, no, she's got she's got my vote up her sleeve." Uh, in the sense, I will only vote no confidence on very strict, you know, <laughs> narrow terms. But anyway, yes. Oh, over there. Sorry. Um, hi, panel. Thanks for your time. This evening's been great. Do you think we need to change the way um, the parliament think of double dissolution? It seems it was called because of the, a the ABCC and it hasn't been mentioned once during this campaign. Um, do you think this will help or hinder the Liberals given that there's a fundamental kind of mistrust in the reason this election was called? Look, I think it's part of the general cynicism about the two major parties, the three major parties that uh, that they are seen to be basically playing games rather than governing the country. And the negativity that was just referred to by Abbott did an enormous amount of damage to the concept of good government. Hmm. And I, I um, wasn't a successful leader of the opposition, but I did see my role as being constructive. Uh, when I disagreed with the government, I disagreed strongly. But if I could get out in front and set the agenda and drag them towards a sensible policy outcome, it was worth doing. Uh, didn't didn't please some of my colleagues, but I think it's constructive. But today, it's a it's a very short-term opportunistic negative game, which was heightened under Abbott. It hasn't improved much. We haven't gone much further, really. If you look at the policy platforms of both sides, they're summarised on television. There's three or four dot points on a page without any detail. 
as to how they're going to be achieved. And of course, one of the things we've noticed in dumbing down of this campaign has been they've both sides have stayed right away from detail, even when they've had a policy that they could have defended. Um, you know, but for example, on climate change, neither of them has been prepared to actually go into any detail in defence of their position. So it's just sort of evaporated to some extent as an issue. You'd wonder why the Labor Party didn't run harder on negative gearing uh, and, and so on, but uh, they've just stayed pretty much on these focus group driven messages day in, day out. I didn't think it was possible to run eight weeks saying jobs and growth and nothing else, <laughs> but it's happened. It's almost impressive. Yeah. It's, all be, it's been all negative risk and yeah, no one's fallen for it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, very, very risk averse strategy. And I think, I think what they wanted to do from day one was really, the coalition anyway, run this really quiet noise, quiet campaign, safe and steady. Oh, Malcolm's a grandpa, by the way. Oh, he's harmless, right? Aren't granddad's harmless? How can you hate a, a granddad? I mean, and it, it's been like that since day one, really, really slow, not going off down that path of fighting with anyone, and particularly Labor for that matter. And they, in fact, the campaign has been that long because they know it's going to fatigue voters. It's been, it's been done for that reason because you switch off, there's been no engagement, it's really, really super hard for Labor to drive engagement on their messaging. And that's what it's proven to be so far. The, the negative stuff isn't working. They've gone three to one on negative. That's a huge gamble. I mean, you can say one thing, but your spending reveals what your strategy is. It's two to one positive for the coalition, three to one neg for Labor. L Labor are trying to get the traction, trying to get momentum any way they possibly can. They're trying to get momentum any way they can. Anything which works is great. But at the same time, we're missing the policy discussion we need to have. What did you think of the fake tradie ad? Um, you know what, I, I, I'm the cynic here, I'm going to say um, that that was a brilliant ad to get distraction away from where Labor are getting momentum on Medicare. All of a sudden, out comes the ad, it's that bad, people were talking about how bad the bad. ad was. It was. Jill, hey, scientist. Was it as, bad as, was it as bad as winding, uh, whinging Wendy? It was just as bad, yeah. And, and I saw a Nationals ad last night with like a proper country song. What, oh, <laughs> hang on. Is this Bob Catter style? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Andrew, we may as well um, uh, let our audience know that you released today some research on negative ads. Can you just give us a, a quick synopsis of what you found? Well, just to touch on the point raised here, um, just you know, in, in the audience, um, that indeed people are just switching off negative. Um, negative ads don't hit any arousal at all. So I did real-time tracking. I, I track people um, as they watch a TV show, put an ad break in, as you would at home right now, and then I. I measured the arousal to the ads in so and what I found was that negative didn't switch anyone off it switched them off and then I did a post test study on what we call recall measures to see okay can you recall anything about the ad itself and if so what did you recall um, so what they recall is nothing about the negative ads at all but what they recalled was I'm going to clean up the conversation here because some of the comments I got were pretty unfiltered um, but they're along the lines of I'm so sick of negative advertising I've had enough of it it doesn't do anything I want to hear them talk about what they stand for negative doesn't do that and it was just a lot of anger about negative advertising um, in campaigns and remember too from day one a lot of people have had experience with it because even before you vote if you're exposed to the message even as a kid we're talking about 16 17 year olds they're exposed to it already they already have a pre-existing negative attitude towards that type of um, advertising that's it well Bob is an old sorry no, I'll, I'll, I'll get your comment waste. no Bob is an, uh, as um, an old campaign director is Andrew standing on its head the perceptions that, that negative actually works scares the bejesus out of everybody well certainly what he says is entirely contrary to uh, my experience everyone always says they hate negative advertising they always have but it's always worked. Uh, that doesn't mean it's working this time, I don't know, he might be right. But uh, uh, the, because, uh, sadly, it, uh, politics is essentially a contest between fear and hope, and fear is always a much more powerful message than hope. Uh, that's uh, a little bit more of a problem for my side of politics on balance, so not every day, I don't mean to say that at all. But on balance, that's one of the one of life's challenges. But it is uh, triggering reactions by raising concerns in the minds of voters is not popular. But it, people do it not because they're stupid, but because they know people don't like it. But they know it has traditionally worked. 
you might quite be right about this election, I have no idea. But uh, in general, that what you say doesn't conform with my experience at all. Jill, I, I, jumped, in, I, I jumped in on you, please. Um, no, no, I've Give us your two again. bobs worth, as we used to I've say. I've got a lot of bobs to give, don't worry. <laughs> um, there's got to be some, it's got to, surely, Andrew, it's got to tap into something underlying, though. Because I think about, like, it, the, it the learner Latham ads, right? Yeah. And the bunting, and that was amazing. Yeah, and, and look, um, it's only early days when I'm doing research-wise, but the thing is, I, I use psychophysiological measures, right? And they don't lie. Yeah. That's your body responding to what I'm showing you. So I can ask you a question, you can lie to me. But if your body won't, so I did eye tracking as well, so um, there is no response. And what that means is that you're not remembering or recalling the message, which means it isn't seen as important enough. And I spent all of today doing a lot of media. Um, I did a 702 Sydney interview um, early this morning where they ran a poll be before I actually did the interview and they told me on air, hey, we'd like to know the result of the poll. And I nearly died thinking, oh, here we go, this could go any way from Sunday. And 89% of people said they really hated negative advertising. And again, social media. I'm surprised it's not 100. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means people don't like it. Yeah. That's not the same thing at all. Yep. But I get what you say. They don't like but, it. But then again, see, you can be aware of the ad, but it doesn't mean it changes your behaviour. Mm. That's the whole point. Your behaviour is going to be changed by something else. You might be aware of it, like these people were, and the emotions they expressed were really high. I mean, I'm saying some of the strongest stuff I've seen in marketing. But um, at the same time, the other things I think were influencing their behaviour, which is where Jill comes into it a bit in the picture, what, I think. What you, what you have to, as I say, I know nothing about what's happening in this election and have no information, so you could well be right about that. But historically, what if you tap into a genuine underlying concern with your negative ads, you reinforce that underlying concern. Uh, that's the infamous one that uh, Paul referred to called Whinging Wendy, for which I take total responsibility and apologise. Um, worked very well. Uh, it was dreadful. And it worked. Graham, and Graham Morris told me, uh, Bob, he was um, working on the Liberal campaign, and he said that that was so devastatingly effective. But he also said it was the, um, and I forget the, what's the jargon, reach and frequency? It was on in every ad break, you know, yeah. sometimes at the top and the bottom of the ad break, you know. So I mean, uh, th th that's right. <laughs> of a negative campaign. <laughs> um, it does work. It can work. It worked very well in the early 90s. I, mean, I was fairly well unknown. It's interesting because I tried to get the Liberal Party organisation to run a 100% positive campaign. It spent three years trying to argue dramatic change and significant reform. And so I called a shadow cabinet meeting and uh, made everyone vote. And there was one vote for a positive campaign. <laughs> that was mine. And the rest, the 100 percent negative. And uh, in those days, they wasted a lot of time and money, I think, uh, trying to discredit Keating. Whereas I was quite happy to ignore him and just focus on the positive message. It worked, though, and, and GST had worked particularly well on health in the final days of that campaign, not so much GST. But I think over time, the credibility of negative campaigning has actually waned a bit. And, uh, you know, when you make extreme claims like in this election, he will privatise Medicare and he says, no, I won't. Well, you know, people just say, oh, I'll just call that a draw and move on. They don't bother taking it either side. And I think it's lost its effectiveness over time because they've become a bit shrill and a bit extreme. Mm. And um, I think uh, that's probably... It won't be as big a factor in this election as it's been in the past. I, I don't share that view. I mean, uh, without saying I enjoy it, the polling today said that 50% of Australians believe the Liberals will privatise Medicare. Mm. Mm. There's a question over here. Oh, uh, thanks. My question's about the last week of the campaign. We had today the costumes released from the LNP and I looked at their savings and they have four dot points, savings of about 2.4 billion, I think, off the top of my head. And it's all about um, really bashing welfare recipients. Um, and how do you think that's going to play out? Well, s sadly, I don't think anybody will notice it, but I, I, I think it is, uh, first of all, absolutely dodgy. And second, if, it, if there is $1.1 billion to save uh, in that way, it's coming from the poorest to fund 
policies in support of the richest, so it's going to reinforce the problem that's going over here, raised right at the first instance. There's a suspicion, though, Bob, that it's a re-announcement from the budget. I, th I think it's just dodgy. I don't think it, it really will happen, but if it does, it's bad. And either way, it was complete hand-waving, right? There was about a paragraph in dot points. You have a comment or a question? Um, I just wonder whether the uh, panel could uh, comment on the potential role of in the election, and perhaps drill down to the contest between, and his name has not yet been um, mentioned, Barnaby Joyce and Tony Windsor in that seat. Jill, would you like to um, lead off? Because before we came out, I was I was full of praise for Barnaby. Um, I, look, I know absolutely nothing about New England. Knowing what I know of, of Joyce, uh, I've, had, I've had friends who've worked for him and spoken so highly of him. I think he must be busting a gut in his seat. But Windsor's got this appeal. You were very, you were full of praise for of Windsor. Well, Tony Windsor's a friend of mine, and I'd love to see him win. But I'd be very surprised, not because his argument doesn't have appeal, but because I think it's uh, running as an independent against the major parties is a trick you can only pull off once. I don't mean you can't get re-elected, but once you leave and try and come back, I think it's much harder. And so I'm pessimistic. I mean. Don't really my Labour Party hat on, just to say Tony is a guy I have a personal regard for and I, I like him and I think he'd probably be better for the Parliament than Barnaby, but, well I know he'd be better for the Parliament than Barnaby, uh, but uh, uh, I'm doubtful that he can win. In terms of preference deals, look, uh, essentially uh, voters make their own mind up. Uh, I remember when the uh, we were running against, when the Australian Democrats were the third party and they put out a card, there were three seats in ACT at the time, they put out a card preferencing my colleague in the northern seat here and, and having an open vote for me in the central seat uh, and we got exactly the same preference flow, it made no difference at all. So I, I don't think, uh, I don't want to get too carried away, voters essentially make their own mind up uh, and uh, other than in the Senate where those Senate deals which hopefully be slightly less powerful this time because of the change to the Senate system. But in the House of Reps, voters are pretty independent. They don't. Well, well there's no registered um, uh, preference flow this time, is there? You, you have to uh, preference it. Yes. I mean, you get a card on the way in, maybe, and you might take notice yeah. of what the Libs want you to do if you're a Lib or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's right. It. But, it's, but there's not that sort of preference whisperer trick that the, that's been, that got... Ricky Muir elected on yeah, that's right. zero point two percent of the vote. But I think, but, but I think the cards. Uh, I'd be interested to hear um, the panel's comment on this. Um, apparently, in this election, uh, the Liberals and the Labor have done a bit of a deal so that the, the um, Labor will preference the Liberals in three regional seats where there's a three-cornered contest. Uh, preference the Liberals ahead of the Nationals and in return the, the Liberals in uh, two or three of the inner city seats will uh, preference Labor ahead of the Greens. Now I don't think those deals would be done if the Liberals or Labor thought it wasn't worth a go and maybe you know it'll get the r r desired result. I mean, look, you'll chase any vote you can get, yeah. right? You're mad not to. Um, the, the, they sort of have preference deals, I find, have two roles. And one's early in the campaign where they're sending a bit of a message about who we are and who we stand for. And we saw the Greens really come a cropper, say, in Sydney, where they preferenced uh, Fred Niles' party over the Liberal candidate. Um, and then at the pointy end, they do have they do have a bigger role than we think. I think usually about half of, of all votes follow the how to vote preference to the letter. Remember, we have an inordinately complicated voting system. The the how to vote cards I've seen for the Senate in the pre polling look like a, a dog's breakfast. I keep using the same term, but uh, they look really hard to follow. So uh, th who knows how that's going to play out? We're going to have really high rates of informality. I think. Um, but they, they will probably come into play, certainly. I think the, just the, the, the deal that's been done in Victoria to preference the Greens last will certainly help Feeney in Batman. Yeah. But I'm not sure he'll still get up, you know, because mm. it's, right. it's very difficult call, that one. It makes a difference probably in Graindler, in New South Wales, and uh, in Sydney, for Tanya Plibersek and uh, for um, Albanese, I guess. Uh, it shores up their vote, but if you look at the betting odds, they're way in front yeah. anyway. Yeah. So it may not make too much difference. So I think in South Australia, they'll probably both preference Xenophon last. 
Um, but um, again, um, if Xenophon's got a head of steam, he can roll a few of those seats on both sides hmm. uh, in South Australia. So well, if you, if, you get, yeah, if you get the primary votes, you can beat the deals, can't you? you know, yeah, well, obviously. If he finishes second in those seats... Yeah. He's, he's OK, well, well it's... Um, by my watch, it's about three minutes to seven, so uh, our very interesting discussion uh, has to draw to an end. I don't know about uh, you, but I think that this election is certainly not a 2007 or a 1996 where it was clear that there would be a change of government. The momentum was out there and was established and the election campaign uh, didn't do much. Uh, in fact, did nothing um, to, to, to change it. This reminds me of a 1998 or maybe a 2010. Uh, it could be a long night. Uh, it's, it's hard to see um, that the government will get the sort of big swing back that, um, that uh, John Howard got in 2004 against Mark Latham, uh, mainly because Malcolm Turnbull's not a third term Prime Minister and Bill Shorten is not Mark Latham. So we're not. For which I am very, very grateful. And, and, um, and we're not going to see the, that final handshake, uh, which was described by Jim Middleton on ABC TV News that night as a Liverpool kiss. <laughs> anyway, so look, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming and supporting this uh, series. Um, the University, the Crawford uh, people, you know, hang on, I'll get the right name. The um, Policy Forum of the Crawford School of uh, Public Policy are uh, quite thrilled with the support the series has had. Uh, so thank you for that. And I, I should also thank very much our distinguished panel. It was a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I have here that... Uh, I should wish everyone all the best for happy voting, so I hope uh, the sausage at the sausage sizzle goes down well. <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs>